Delivering Justice, WW Law and the Fight for Civil Rights by Jim Haskins, illustrated by Benny Andrews. Savannah, Georgia, 1932. The smell of his grandma's biscuits lured Wesley to the kitchen. Wesley was excited because today was Thursday, the day he would see his mother. The rest of the week, she worked for a white family just outside Savannah, cooking, cleaning, and taking care of their children. This was her day off. Grandma's friend, Old John, was sitting at the table. Wesley loved listening to the old man's stories. Old John had been born a slave. He had been taken from his mother and had never known her. He was nine, Wesley's age, when he and all the slaves were freed in 1865. Wesley felt lucky. At least he saw his own mama once a week. Easter Shopping at Levy's Once a year, sometime before Easter, Grandma would take Wesley down to Levy's department store on Broughton Street to buy one nice outfit. They used a Levy's charge card and then paid a little bit each month. On one shopping trip, the saleswoman would not serve them until after all the white customers had been helped. Wesley had heard the saleswoman politely call the white woman customers Miss and Mrs., but she treated his grandma as if she were a child, a nobody. Wesley's grandma pretended not to notice. She was polite, but she was also proud. Come on, she said. It's time to go home. They left the store without buying a thing. Segregation. Back then, black people weren't treated as well as white people. Most of the time, they were kept segregated from whites. Wesley went to a separate school for black children. He had to drink from water fountains marked collared. He could not sit and eat at the levee's lunch counter. His Grandma's Prayers Sometimes Wesley got angry that black people were mistreated and that no matter how hard his mother worked, they were still poor. But his grandma was always there to talk with him. She understood why he was upset, but she didn't want him to have bad feelings about himself. She said that no matter how he was treated, he had no excuse not to be somebody. She told him again about the day he was born. She said, I got on my knees and prayed that you would grow up to be a leader of our people. Wesley promised himself that he would fulfill his grandma's prayer. He also promised himself that he would work hard so that one day his mother would not have to work in someone else's house. Voter Schools, 1942 Wesley knew that many black people didn't vote because they had to pass a test to register. The test was designed to be difficult for black folk to pass. It was intended to keep them from voting. Wesley was a member of the Youth Council of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. The Youth Council started a special voter school in the basement of a church. With his friend Clifford, Wesley talked to everyone, even passers-by, about voting. When he found someone who, scared by the test, had never registered to vote, he took them to the voter school. When they felt ready to take the test, Wesley went with them to the courthouse and stayed until they were registered. With Wesley's help and encouragement, many black people in Savannah became registered voters. Working as a Mailman, 1949 After college and the Army, Wesley wanted to be a teacher, but because of his membership in the NAACP, no one in Savannah would hire him. So Wesley became a mailman. The Postal Service hired qualified people, regardless of their collar. As it turned out, this job suited Wesley just fine. Good morning, Miss Sally Lawrence Jenkins, Wesley sang out to a young woman in her garden. Here's a letter from your sister. Wesley liked to address people by their full names. He could trace a person's history in their name, and history was important to Wesley. If you don't know where you've been, how do you know where you're going? He loved to ask. At the NAACP office, February 1960. After work, Wesley spent long evenings at the NAACP office. One night, he was visited by a group of students who were excited about what was happening in Greensboro, North Carolina. Young black people there had staged a sit-in at a lunch counter in a local store. They had refused to leave until they were served. 
the students standing in front of Wesley wanted to do the same thing at the department stores on Broughton Street, but they needed a leader. Wesley remembered how his grandma had been treated at Levy's, and he agreed to help. But first, the students had to be trained. They had to protest without ever using violence, even if the other side did. If they were attacked and they fought back, Wesley told them, their cause would be lost. NAACP Sit-In Strategy 1. Dress Neatly 2. Enter Together 3. Sit Together 4. Order Politely 5. Do Not React to Insults 6. Leave Together Levy's Lunch Counter After weeks of training, small groups of students made their way downtown, entering the big stores along Broughton Street, and sat down at the lunch counters. The stores refused to serve them. At Levy's, the manager called the police, who arrested the students for breaking the city's segregation laws. Throwing down their cards. Wesley called a mass meeting the next Sunday at the Bolton Street Baptist Church. People filled the pews and balconies. Wesley opened the meeting with a hymn. All the voices singing together made a thunderous sound and the mighty noise made people think that perhaps, working together, they could really make something happen. Wesley spoke about the arrest of the young people at Levy's. He said that things had to change, and he asked if people were ready to fight for their rights. Someone shouted, I'll never shop at that store again! Then someone in the balcony threw down a Levy's charge card. Soon, everyone was tossing charge cards into a big pile in the church. The boycott begins March 17, 1960. The next morning, Wesley led a group downtown. They carried baskets full of charge cards. At Levy's, Wesley and his group dumped the baskets of charge cards onto the sidewalk. Then Wesley announced that no black people would shop at any store on Broughton Street until they were treated equally. The Great Savannah Boycott had begun. Picket Lines Wesley and the other members of the NAACP organized a picket line every day in front of Levy's. White people yelled and jeered at the protesters and tried to force them off the sidewalk. But day after day, the protesters returned. One day, a large, burly white man punched one of the demonstrators in the face and broke his jaw. But everyone remembered what Wesley had taught them. They didn't yell or fight back, no matter how much they wanted to. Wesley organized other protests. There were kneel-ins at the white churches on Sundays and wade-ins at the all-white beach at Tybee. Wesley wanted to end segregation everywhere in Savannah, in libraries, theaters, public pools, beaches, and restrooms, as well as at lunch counters. Talking about peaceful change. Large meetings were held every Sunday at different churches. Protesters talked about their activities. Some gave fiery speeches. The meetings became so popular that no church was big enough to hold everyone who wanted to get in. For a year and a half, no one from the black community shopped on Broughton Street. Wesley walked down the street and started counting. One, two, three, four, five, going out of business signs. The white store owners couldn't stay in business without black customers. When he delivered mail to white people, Wesley told them how much he loved Savannah. He wanted the city to be a better place for everyone. They respected Wesley. They saw how peaceful and committed to change the protesters were. Little by little, more and more white people began to sympathize with the protesters. Desegregation Without Violence White people in the community who supported Wesley asked what they could do to end segregation and stop the boycott. Together, leaders from the white and black communities worked out a plan. Each evening after delivering the mail, Wesley organized a group of students to sit in at a different kind of business or facility the next day. The theaters would be first, then the restaurants, then the library, and on down the line until every business had been desegregated. Sometimes angry crowds would gather, or white people would leave in protest when the black students arrived, but most of the white and black leaders stuck together. 
the mayor made sure that all the signs marking separate facilities for black and whites at City Hall, the courthouse, health department, and hospital were taken down. City officials took the segregation laws off the books. Unlike desegregation efforts in other cities and towns in the South, there was very little violence in Savannah. Justice Delivered On a Sunday in September 1961, Wesley greeted the hundreds of people who arrived at a downtown Savannah church. Inside, their voices joined together to sing out, We are soldiers in God's army. When the song ended, Wesley stood in front of the crowd. He saw his mother sitting in the front row. He saw students who had been arrested. He saw faces beaming with pride. Then he announced in a loud, clear voice, We have triumphed. Savannah was the first southern city in the United States to declare all its citizens equal, three years before the Federal Civil Rights Act made all segregation illegal. People, both black and white, saw Wesley as Savannah's hero. He had kept the protest disciplined and peaceful, even in the face of violence. Modestly, he would say, I was just doing what every black American should be doing. Wesley Wallace Law delivered more than just the mail to the citizens of Savannah. He delivered justice, too. His grandma's prayers had been answered.